Oh no, my 3D print has come out with slight imperfections. I must immediately throw it away and print it again, obviously. Is the usual response that most people make, and I think that's a little wasteful. Hi, I'm Edsgar, and this is my 45mm anti-tank gun for my Soviet Bolt Action Army that I have 3D printed. And we can see there's a few imperfections in some various parts of the model um, because it didn't print perfectly. However, I think that these imperfections are irrelevant given how I'm going to be building the model. And so let's quickly have a look at each of the three imperfections that I've identified and what I'm going to do about them. If we start at the back, we can see these two recoil struts. Uh, they should not only be the same length, but they should also be quite a bit longer than they actually are. And that's because they kind of fused into the raft and broke when they uh, separated away. But that's not going to be too much of a problem because when I mount it to the base, and I'll talk about the base itself later, I'm going to mount it something like there and I can pile up a big mound of sand and other things with super glue or PVA glue or whatever. I can just make a little mound and have the recoil supports just go into the mound. And then I can put a sandbag over the top and say it's a defensive position. They've raised up the supports to lower the uh, elevation of the gun, which is a thing that was done. The second imperfection on this particular model, again, it's to do with the raft of the 3D print. But the, uh, the bottom of the wheels is, um, well, it's not exactly round all the way around. But just like these recoil supports, I can just pile that up with various ground effect, mud, like just a pile of mud, which I'll make out of sand or, or some other kind of texture material. We'll see what I've got in my collection. And I can even add a spade from the plastic kit. Um, there's some shovels here. I can throw in a shovel there just to make it look like they've in, they've actually dug it in to uh, control the recoil. That sort of thing makes sense to me. The third thing, and I'm not actually sure what happened with this, it seems to have separated at some point. It's kind of a bit strange. Certainly it bent because some of these supports were probably failing, uh, but then it's kind of cut off at an odd angle. And that's actually easy for me to fix as well, although I'd like to print just the muzzle piece and kind of cut this off flat and glue the muzzle piece on, that would be an option. But because I'm going for a very snowy theme for my Soviet army, that makes this a very easy thing to fix. Because one of the things that was regularly done with kind of artillery pieces and anti-tank guns is to camouflage them and in snowy conditions you can get a white sheet and throw this white sheet over or you can get a roll of fabric and wrap it around the barrel and that is exactly what I'm going to do here. So let's break out the miller part and let's get some sculpting done. Which, this should be fun. And getting stuck into this in a different order to what I've just explained because I want to sort out the barrel first. The millipot wasn't sticking all too well to the resin and this is partly because the surface area I'm pressing into is small but it's also winter when filming so even warming the putty by mixing is still not as warm as it would be in other times. That is a super easy thing to deal with, just a dot of super glue on that layer separation and squish the putty on and it holds well enough to get to sculpting. Rounding off this little lump pretty basically as I know I can sand or cut a nice flat edge once it's cured. Then the real difficulty came with trying to make a nice neat flat thin strip of milliput to wrap around the barrel and again it was fighting me. The old clay in cold conditions does not behave. Well, as stubborn as the millipot can be, I can be just as stubborn. And I worked at it for a few minutes and I got something that yeah, kind of looked acceptable to me. And to sell the effect a little easier, I made just a piece of a larger sheet to throw over the corner of the gun shield. I had made up a much larger batch of milliput, so I used all that was left to make these kind of supporting mounds of mud on the side of the base, or at least to start to make the shape of them. I'm not trying to be too neat at this stage, I just want to leave enough room for the crew. And with the extra volume it really makes the base seem more lively than the totally flat surface that it started out as. So let me pan back to my past self for that. 
I did mention that base and um, I kind of need to redo it because I was just playing around with some things and uh, not everything has stuck. What this is, is this is all of the leftover resin from when I mix, um, well, resin apparently. And that's because I use something like this, various pots and food containers, but this one is a spray can lid and it just happens to be 60 millimeters on the inside. And so I'll have my resin and I'll mix it up and I'll pour it out. But you always get a little bit left in. And after a few times, like five or 10 or 15 times, that uh, ends up being quite a thick piece of resin. And I pop it out, clean up the edges, sand it down. And there you go, there's a 60 millimeter base for effectively free and by accident. So that's a pretty, pretty handy thing. Just about the right size for my, I mean, maybe it's a little tight. Um, thankfully the anti-tank gun only has a crew of two. And here's how it all looks as the milliput cures. But before gluing it down to the base, I felt it might work better if I painted the gun separately. The sub assemblies and all that. The infantry for my Soviet bolt action army is painted very simply and expediently. So continuing that simple style into the artillery pieces should tie their look together. And much like my infantry who get a tan primer, this gun gets a military drab green which will be the most common colour on the finished piece. On top of this I painted a lot of small shadows at the edges in a darker, richer green. I'm not aiming for a base coat here over the primer, I'm just using a little bit of this green to enhance it and give it some depth. And then comes my fleckle technique, which is applied in a slightly different way to my Tanith camera pattern that I've shown on the channel so many times already. Rather than filling in the entire surface with flecks of various colours, I'm layering all of the colours that I want to use here on top of each other in specific locations. First with black to keep the tone of the later colours muted, but some of the black will end up showing through and that can give the impression of mould or dirt or some other damage than the specific layers that will follow. The next is orange, quite a bright orange, but in these small spotty fleckles it just gives a hint of rust to all of the damage that the black has created. It's almost certainly unrealistic the amount of damage and rust and particularly the location that I'm putting them at, but I have taken the deliberate decision to land somewhere in between realistic, historical and artistic, but also expedient when it comes to how I'm painting this army. I also specifically chose to paint this entire army with a non-metallic metal on all of the metalwork. For those who haven't heard the term before, when painting very small miniatures like this, there are specific metallic paints that have little reflective flakes that give a certain effect and it looks pretty good as metal. But it doesn't always look perfectly realistic. It's a very characterful metal look. For a more realistic look, there is a technique called non-metallic metal, and that's because you use normal non-metallic paints to paint in that effect. In my case, I'm using black, white, and gray, and the technique is to paint in the reflections that a metallic surface would have. And I am terrible at it, but it's something that I want to learn, and the best way to learn is to do. Practice, armed with a little bit of research, is a great teacher if you don't have an actual teacher. So adding some light grey flex to my overlaid fleckles already to give it the impression of tiny bits of flaking paint revealing the bare metal underneath. But also particularly around the edges as if the paint's been scraped off, but that's very much in the style of an edge highlight. Most of that doesn't really count as non-metallic metal specifically. It kind of does, but it's not the most recognisable style. But I also wanted to break up the green a little, because it's all green so far, and so I chose some parts of the model, the guns barrel, the breech, as well as the wheel hubcaps, to do a more deliberate non-metallic. Again, I'm not very good with the non-metallics yet, I'm still practicing, and this is a perfect place for me to do that practice. And yeah, I guess it's really weird that I'm painting in a very simple expedient paint scheme for this army, and then also painting non-metallic metals on this army. I'm strange, I know, well aware. And after painting up the cloth with brown into white to make a dirty white sheet look, 
I ruined all of my hard work with a total coat of dark brown ink wash over the entire model to dirty it up and to give the recesses some easy shading. And with the gun complete, I should get to the crew. Speaking of the crew, I've saved one of the plastic quilted uniforms, but I also have this. And this comes from another one of my videos recently, where I kind of lamented at all of the spare arms and the spare heads. While they're really cool, the plastic kits come with all these extra parts. It's kind of sad that the uh, the extra ones that don't get used just end up dumped in a in in the bits box and never get used. Well, if you can 3D print some bodies, you can use the plastic arms and heads. And there is just enough space for them both on this 60mm base. And that's even with all the earthworks I'm going to be adding. I think I painted the gun crew on a live stream some time ago, but I don't actually remember which one it was and I can't find it, so I have no footage of painting them. But they got the same super quick paint scheme as my Soviet infantry, and that just leaves the base to finish up. I mixed up the worst kept secret in the terrain building world, which is flower based texture paste. PVA glue, brown paint and flour in whatever ratio you like, a little salt to stop it going mouldy, and I added just a little bit of sand as well, some variety in texture. I started throwing it around on the base before realising I should probably glue the gun down more securely than with PVA glue in the texture paste, but super glue isn't that strong to begin with. Hopefully the both combined will hold it in place and it will survive transport to and from games. After that was down, I filled over all of the imperfections on the print, the broken struts, the weird shapes in the wheels. PVA and flour, particularly with a little more flour, really does hold its shape quite well as it dries. And just for that last little trick, I wrapped the base of the loader in cling film, pressed it down into the mud as it was drying, and this leaves a round impression of the loader's base that once everything is dry, I can place the model on and move it around as one piece, but I can also remove it to indicate a casualty. And would you look at that after drying, this uh, totally unusable 3D print that was broken beyond repair has been repaired and put into use. And I've even actually used this in a game already. And I will mention that this, uh, the STL for the gun is by KPI1986 on Thingiverse, and so I'll leave a link to that in the description. Do pop past and tell them I sent you. But also post in the comments down below if you have any kind of stories of broken 3D prints that you've repaired, or if you have any kind of ideas about what I've been working on. There's a lot of experimentation and different things and trying new things uh, with this particular project, and I think it came out fairly well, although, I haven't put the snow on yet. I need to get some snow effects so that my whole army can be winter themed because that's stylistic and cool. I want to do it. So pop past the description box and share the video and all that nonsense. But for now, I'm Ed Scar, always will be, and thank you very much for watching.